Hi everyone, I'm Matt Stewart, Global Marketing Manager at IQVIA Consumer Health, and welcome to today's webinar, Switch On, the next generation of RX to OTC Switch. We have a great lineup of guests to do that. We have Julie Aker, who's Vice President, General Manager of Concentrics Research and IQVIA Business. Dr. Volker Spitzer, Vice President of R&D and RWE Services at IQVIA Consumer Health. Michelle Bouliard, who's Vice President and Global Category Lead for RWE at IQVIA Real World Solutions. And we're delighted to welcome our special guest, uh, Vidhu Bansal Dev, who's Vice President of RX to OTC Switch and Digital Transformation at Halion in the US. And now, given the packed agenda we have today, I want to jump straight in with Volker and and really take a look at where we are today with Switch. And Volker, I think firstly, should we go to our audience here with a with a quick poll just to find out where they are? Sure. And so this is your first live poll here. Where are you on your RX to OTC Switch journey? Four options. You're either actively conducting a switch, contemplating a switch, exploring long-term switch strategies, or you're not involved and just have an interest in this subject. So click a, an option on the slide, and uh, I'll give you a few seconds just to do that. OK, let's have a look at the answers. A few still coming in. So if we look at uh, we look at these, Volker, very briefly here, so 23% actively conducting a switch, and then 41% not involved but have an interest in the subject. So a nice blend here of people exploring long-term strategies people explore, uh, conducting switches themselves and then people just with an overall interest um, in the in the, uh, in this topic area. So, Volker, we know our audience then. Let's quickly review why we're here today. You know, why are we spending time talking about switch? Yeah, Matt, as you know, RX to OTC switches have emerged as a significant driver of growth for the OTC industry, playing in strong role in innovation development and delivering so, uh, strong sales performances over many decades. In the US, the impact of switch heritage has been considerable, contributing 1.7 billion in sales, which accounts 35% of total sales. And seven out of the top 20 brands in the US owe their success to switches. That's quite a number. And similarly in Europe, switch heritage has been a critical growth driver, generating 1.4 billion in sales representing 42, even more than in the US, of total sales. And eight of top 20 brands in Europe are from Switch Heritage. These figures underscore the importance of RX OTC Switch being a catalyst for growth and innovation for the consumer health industry. And as consumers, we all know the brands and use them in many cases, like a family, family medicine over many decades. Absolutely. And I guess if we bring it forward a little bit into the last few years, have we seen a kind of consistent flow of switches coming through? Yes, so over, over the eight years, what you see on the chart here, there have been a consistent flow of switches across regions with a bit less activity during 18 and 2019. Since 2020, there have been nine switches in the US and about 67 switches in the EU, led by Poland, the UK, Spain and Switzerland, among other EU countries. Especially the UK and Poland have been very active recently. Just last week, the UK government announced plans to collaborate with the industry to facilitate even more switches. The authorities are actively looking for switch candidates and remarkably also consider products already available as OTC in other countries. So they want to take the learnings from other countries to make it easier over there. And for the EU and UK, we can see that many switches are kind of innovative, being either new treatments for new to OTC indications or novel to OTC active ingredients. Some examples here you see like emergency contraception, hormone regulated contraception, erectile dysfunction, malaria prevention, psoriasis and vaginal atrophy. When we talk about switches, it's very important that we look on the sales process, how consumers buy the products. In the UK and EU, we have a similar process and typically we have pharmacy only or general sales categories. And the pharmacy-only status allows pharmacists to guide consumers on correct product usage. And required when it's, when it's required by regulation, pharmacists can also have the responsibility to make sure that consumers are suitable for a specific OTC drug. And this additional safety step, right at the purchase of a moment, is very helpful to ensure that the OTC drug is used appropriately, 
the risk uh, of misuse is reduced and side effects or potential interaction with other substances are avoided. Okay, and, and you mentioned there's some kind of innovative switches that have, have come onto the market in the last few years. Can you give a, a real world example here of, of what we mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. You, you see here on the chart the treatment of erectile dysfunction with PDE5 inhibitors. They are a really good example because they emerged only in the last uh, 10 years, if you want so. It has already been taking place in New Zealand, Poland, UK and Switzerland. And it's a good example for a switch where pharmacist supervision is required. Here, the access to products is not like an unregulated free for all, but a controlled and monitored process by the pharmacist. And the same is true for recent switches of uh, Tadalafil, another erectile dysfunction medication, which is now available as OTC in Poland, and this year also was switched by, by Sanofi in the UK. In these cases, an interaction with the pharmacist is required to buy the product and to ensure safe and appropriate use of the medication. This includes uh, the completion of a dedicated health questionnaire when you are in the pharmacy to find out if the consumer is eligible for the drug. It's very remarkable, I think, that when we look at Norway, they changed their regulation in 2018 to increase the number of OTC drugs without a prescription. So for this, they created a third OTC category called non-prescription medicines with guidance. And as a consequence, they changed then the status of Sildenafil to OTC uh, shortly after that. Okay. And... Um... That is interesting though. We've spoken a lot about Europe in this slide and the, the previous one. What about the US? What are we seeing there? Yeah, in the US, there have been a lot of switches. More of them were established categories such as seasonal allergies, but there are also some notable innovative switches. One example is Voltarin, and it's the first OTC topical arthritis pain treatment in the US. And this year, uh, naloxone as an antidote for opioid overdose was switched. In comparison to the UK or EU, uh, the OTC products are immediately available for general sales. There's, there's no pharmacy only or OTC with guidance category. This means that consumers can grab the product, pay and walk out of the door without any conversation with the pharmacist. And this is probably one of the reasons why the US has also stricter requirements for OTC switches. But having said that, in the future, we may expect that the application of also more innovative sales models that leverage additional digital capabilities. This would lead to a more, if you want to so personalize and conditional sales process, providing detailed digital guidance for consumers. Well, let's I'll just make it up. I don't know if that will happen, but let's, let's look at it. And if you want to, so it's kind of a digital version of the behind the counter approach that we have currently in Europe. And Julie, uh, Julie will talk about that in a minute. Okay, and a crucial part here also, though, is the kind of, um, especially for the commercial angle of the product, is the exclusivity for a switch. Is that correct? Absolutely. And in general, there's no exclusivity if you do a switch, right? But regulatory frameworks may grant marketing exclusivity if a company provided essential data, which was crucial to support this specific switch decision. And in the U.S., dedicated decision-influencing clinical trials are needed to qualify for this marketing exclusivity. For instance, again, Voltaren Arthritis Pain received three years of marketing exclusivity due to new studies supporting, or new studies even, supporting its safety and efficacy for OTC use. Conversely, in the EU or UK, we only have one year of exclusivity. And uh, the requirements are basically very similar to the US. And there's only rare example. One, one is uh, the switch of uh, HRA Pharma's emergency contraceptive, ELA-1. Uh, so it's not used very much. And the industry is also not very happy about the current exclusivity po possibilities in Europe, as it's only one year and they advocate for better protection, uh, considering also the extensive work and investment uh, they put into these switch projects. It's more than fair, I think. In this context, also the usage of real-world evidence is something what we need to consider and it's a hot topic and Michelle will look into this later today. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as you've just described there, I mean, the exclusivity, you know, um, is kind of needed and wanted by people, especially the effort that goes into kind of uh, completing a switch successfully here. And we're looking at this slide. What are the kind of the, the typical prerequisites that, that a company is going to do for a drug to be switched to OTC status? 
Yeah, man, those requisites are basically the same over the globe. There's some differences here and there. So the drug should be well established in terms of safety profile, low toxicity, minimal side effects minimal misusage and abuse potential, right? that's for sure. Then the drug should be also effective for its intended OTC usage. And the, the, indica- the, the condition should be self-diagnosable by consumers and also self-treatable. That's very important. In the US, you have additionally the ability of self-selection. Uh, we have in mind here the general sales model, as I explained before. And finally, uh, all these products need to come with a clear, comprehensible introduction regarding dosage, usage, potential side effects, and so on to ensure safe usage. These guidelines are established since decades, and probably they will stay as they are for many years and even probably more decades. The question is, uh, however, how we will manage those requirements in the future. Again, digital technologies may support consumers much more than it's currently happening and to make them, to help them to make the right health decisions. We know then switch is a long-term effort. It's a long-term undertaking for companies. What's the win at the end of it? What's the, what, why invest behind it? Yeah, I think the nice part of switches is that everybody is winning here. So when we look first at the consumer perspective, Overall, we see a global rise in self-care practices driven by the increased desire of autonomy uh, for health management by consumers. Consumers are becoming more health conscious due to increased health literacy, right? And the use of digital health tools are certainly supporting there. The COVID pandemic was also accelerating this trend uh, and, and where personal health management was crucial because the doctors were not available or it was difficult to visit them, right? And this shift paired with the need for affordable, accessible medicines and on top an aging population requiring also access to chronic treatments highlight the growing desire for improved healthcare. And uh, uh, for healthcare systems, there's a notable economic benefits and relief, uh, what was demonstrated in many different studies. It optimizes both time and financial resources, facilitating a more targeted allocation of healthcare resources and fosters improvement or health management uh, within communities. And then we look at the HCPs, right? So first of all, if a product is switched, that means also people go less to the healthcare providers, to the doctors that can focus more on more complex conditions. And the pharmacies, on the other hand, expand can expand their role and services, enhancing their importance in the whole self-care or healthcare delivery. And from public health perspective, most OTC products enhance acute and chronic health outcomes through easier medication access, potentially fostering better adherence and healthier populations. Last but not least, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it's important for them because it's a shield against the patent cliff as revenue usually drops post-patent expiry due to competition from generics. And by switching companies, and we have seen that over decades now, can maintain a revenue stream and develop long-term innovation pipelines, uh, improving products through line extensions, reaching more, and also new consumers. So in conclusion, the shift of OTC medicines positively impacts all stakeholders, promising an efficient, effective, and more consumer-driven healthcare. Okay, and I think that's something we're all kind of striving for here on this call. And thanks, Volker, for setting the scene. And as you mentioned earlier, let's have a look at what's going on in now one of the most important switch markets, and that's the US. And I'm delighted to welcome Julie to provide some insights about the current framework in the US, as well as how we might consider innovative approaches that might accelerate uh, kind of switch programs. And Julie, you have decades of experience in switch and i wanted to start with what are the trends that you're seeing that could impact switch in the future thank you matt well it's an exciting time for self-care who doesn't want more control over their health care uh, but we want to innovate in switch and to do that we really need to consider where healthcare is headed in the future and it's headed for accessible and expanded self-care so healthcare futurists tell us that healthcare will continue to decentralize out of large healthcare systems to community services. And you're probably all seeing that in your own communities right now. Uh, care will be con- continue to become more self-directed as consumers demand increased access and control over their healthcare. We now have more options available where this is already starting to happen with health portals and connected care. This demand for more self-directed care will increasingly include self-management of chronic conditions and continuous use products. 
So with increased demands for accessible, safe, and effective medications comes the expectations for flexible options and convenience. We all know that we're more likely to take medicines and comply with those directions if it's easy and convenient to do so. So we now have increased access through online ordering and even delivery right to our doorstep. And we've also begun to see the possibilities with uh, sensors and wearables that, we, that can monitor a variety of health status indicators. So technology will continue to connect consumers to their pharmacies and their doctor's offices, hospitals, and, and these will enable more self-monitoring of these conditions that we all have. And technology will evolve using AI and machine learning to customize labeling and provide guidance for a specific consumer with a specific health history. All of this right now is in the future, but it's all within reach. Absolutely. And so now we're, it's, it's almost in reach, it's in touching distance, and we're, we're looking at the, a wider than minor self-treatable conditions market here. I mean, this is really an opportunity to have an impact on public health. Yes, the ultimate impact is improved public health, and that's really why we're all in this together. Uh, we all want to make a difference. We all want to improve public health. Uh, but this doesn't happen if we can't get new OTCs to consumers who can benefit from them. Uh, there are many first-in-class switch programs that are in progress right now. Uh, and from these, we know that chronic conditions can be managed and continuous use products can be used properly, uh, some with and some without technology tools. But when one considers the staggering chronic health crisis in the U.S., it becomes clear that the impact can be expanded and accessible OTCs could make a, make a real impact on public health. Uh, if you consider cardiovascular disease alone, there have been nearly 700,000 deaths a year from just this one condition. And if we can, can put access right into the palm of the hand of a consumer through a smartphone or mobile device, how great is that in terms of making it more accessible and more convenient? And for products where the labeling is more challenging, Consumers can take a quick web-based health survey that has embedded algorithms to facilitate uh, correct self-selection decisions before use. And some of those programs have even embedded uh, ongoing use support for the during use phase of the program. And what then though, are the, the kind of key success factors when we're looking at doing a switch? What, what is it that needs to be done to really get a switch project across the line? Very good question. Um, we've been doing a lot of these programs through the past 35 years. And uh, in doing so many of these programs, we have learned that there are some key success factors. So let me review a few. I've got eight that I'll cover. Number one, start with an objective benefit risk assessment. Of course, we all focus on the benefits, but we have to focus on the risks as well. And that needs to be a real objective look. So the first step is that objective uh, benefit uh, risk assessment, and that should be the foundation on which you build your strategy for your program. Secondly, incorporate your risk assessment and strategy into your consumer development program. Think about what evidence is going to be required, and in short, what evidence do you need to provide to regulators to prove that consumers can use the product safely and effectively? Three, make meet with your regulatory authority and assure that the plan is discussed and aligned to the extent possible. But for areas in which you're not fully aligned, seek clarification, offer suggestions, and determine what evidence is going to be required and why. Four, fine tune your labeling and tech tools with an iterative process. This involves testing, learning, adjusting, and then repeating. It's important to get the labeling and the tools optimized because they'll follow you through the program if you don't. Five, consider study sequencing and those things that can be done in parallel. And also consider when you want to meet with regulatory authorities, making those decisions on timeline and regulatory interactions and have a significant impact on your timeline. Six, listen to consumers. They're going to be, if they're confused, they're going to give you feedback about that. And we need to consider that and adjust this in the program. If we don't, uh, we'll continue to see issues through the program. They also have great suggestions to offer if you ask qualitative questions at the end of research to get their insights about what was easy or difficult or confusing. Seven, listen and partner with regulators. We may not always agree, so be prepared to defend your methods and approaches if they're reasonable and valid and defend your position with data and literature, but don't try to over mitigate poor results. And lastly, 
innovate, but educate. There's an encouragement by FDA to be innovative. Uh, regulators don't have the benefit of being in all the discussions that we have internally on these innovative approaches. So all new approaches will need an explanation and a rationale. And it may be necessary to present this information multiple times, especially if there are different attendees at different regulatory meetings. So we should be innovating, but we should also educate to explain the why and the how of these new approaches. Okay, and, and Julia, I wanted to talk um, about something you touched upon earlier very briefly. And are we seeing things then such as digital tools already being incorporated into uh, Switch and Switch projects? Yes, we are. Digital tools are now being incorporated into active RX to OTC Switch programs for a variety of reasons. Uh, the most common reason is to facilitate correct cell selection. And the reason for this is that this has been one of the key reasons some switches have not moved forward in the past. That technology can also assist in proper use and medication adherence during use. It can provide education, facilitate tracking of progress and providing feedback, and can even simplify reordering to improve, improve dosing uh, adherence. But this is really only the beginning. Further innovations are on the horizon to facilitate self-care such as notifying one's health care professional about progress or issues or questions, or identifying drug-drug interactions with current medications, or incorporating diagnostic information such as blood pressure or glucose, um, and incorporating information on environmental or local health trends such as changes in the allergy and po pollen count or uh, infectious diseases that are going on in the area. Okay, and, and I mean, this sounds all very exciting, but I mean, has there been challenges too? I mean, what challenges exist in today's switch development programs? There, there have been challenges, um, and I can talk about just a couple. Um, for, for label comprehension, as an example, we're seeing uh, a lot of repeated rounds of testing being required. And this is happening because as the program evolves, regulators are giving additional input on the labeling and the content. And when that, the labels change and the expectations on those labels change, then there are additional it forces, additional or repeated studies, and that causes delays. Um, for self-selection, there's always, these studies have always been an important part of a switch program. Uh, and a pivotal uh, self-selection study has historically been required for first-in-class switches. But um, in the recent past, there's been an increased focus on special populations who should not use the product. Uh, so separate targeted self-selection studies are being required for many of these programs. And in some cases, there are three or four different populations and studies being required in hundreds of patients with certain medical conditions. And this, as you can imagine, increases time and cost and, and also presents challenges in recruiting some of those special populations. For actual use studies, it's always been challenging to balance the needs of an uncontrolled clinical trial, which is what an actual use trial really is, with the need to reflect this hands-off OTC environment and real world conditions. And this continues to be a challenge to generate the necessary data without interacting with participants too much. But with all challenges come opportunities um, to further innovate and uh, there's, there are new ways to provide evidence to support a switch. For example, what about new methods for testing comprehension? Or what about aligning countries to produce the burden of proof, aligning with other countries to produce that, that burden of proof for comprehension? Uh, what, what about while conducting uh, virtual studies and, and, and expanding and making that more efficient, which we've all done, uh, but we've even doing so, we have seen that U.S. studies continue to grow in size over the years and now hundreds of participants with very high success thresholds are required, while other countries have smaller sample sizes and lower success thresholds, often 80% versus, say, 90 or 95% for an observed rate. Uh, can we reconsider what is needed to actually provide sufficient evidence of comprehension? And what about the use of real world data to reflect the use of a drug in special populations or to determine the true incidence of adverse events versus attempting to obtain these data in a simulation like an actual use trial? Or could we consider the use of data from other countries that have already conducted a switch? And finally, what about the potential to answer lingering questions with post-approval data? Not all questions can be answered in the context of an actual use study. However, at this time, there's not a mechanism to do this in the US. Okay, and, and you mentioned that uh, kind of how real-world data may provide 
an innovative way to provide supportive data in a switch program. Could you explain to us how this might work? Yeah, that we haven't really leveraged real world data in switch like we could. And there's a huge opportunity here. And the way to maybe think about it is what data would be helpful before the switch, during the switch and after the switch. So even before you even start working on a program, think about the feasibility stage. You could use real world data to evaluate the feasibility of potential switch by looking at the incidence of the indication, prescription sales, competing products, uh, status of patents, regulatory framework in the country, the study population and ages, and whether this is a first-in-class switch or an indication that's already approved. And then if you do start your program, think about getting bottom line or foundational uh, real world standard of care information. What are the current physician practice patterns for diagnosing and treating this condition? And how are patients currently using this drug at home? During the switch, real world data could help us answer questions about special populations or incidents of adverse events or even drug drug interactions and could facilitate discussions with FDA about these topics. And after the switch, Claims could be generated, new indications, new populations could be explored, and the use of digital platforms or online tools could be further expanded to bring, bring even more benefits to consumers for education and compliance, even pay, patient satisfaction surveys and feedback could be obtained. So there are many opportunities to advance more innovative approaches for data collection for SWITCH that go well beyond the, the traditional studies that are currently being required. And these innovative approaches could significantly accelerate programs and facilitate quicker access for consumers who can really benefit from these medications. Okay, thanks, Julia. And as you said there, we're going to probably dive into RWE a little bit more now, and I want to bring Michelle in. And um, Michelle, as we are increasingly hearing more about the use of real-world data and real-world evidence, can you start off just by explaining to us what we mean in this context. Yes, yes, Matt, of course, delighted to be here today talking about real world evidence and uh, real world data. And just to start by saying the use of real world data and real world evidence is an emerging discipline. And as such, there's not yet a universally agreed upon definition, although there are some initiatives underway to harmonize this. So let's look here at some of these definitions. I've taken different definitions from across different regions, from different agencies, and also they've been published at different time points. And in summary, what they are saying is that real world data is data relating to patient health status that is collected from settings which resemble everyday practice. So collected outside of controlled experimental settings such as randomized controlled trials. And the data collected can come from a variety of sources. And real world evidence, this is the evidence derived from the analysis of this real world data. It's important to also note here that in order to generate real world evidence, the appropriate epidemiological and biostatistical methods need to be applied to the processing and analysis of this data. Okay, and as the variety of available data sources is kind of a key enabler here to be able to generate real world evidence. Can you provide some examples of, on what are these sources that, that we're looking for? Yeah, sure. And as, as highlighted in the definition, real world data are data that come from sources other than traditional clinical trials and that can inform on health status or risk and potential benefits of a drug or, or a medical device. And these data sources can include data derived from electronic medical records or medical claims data. Data sources can include data that's collected from observational perspective and retrospective studies or from product or disease registries. And it can also include data generated from other newer emerging sources such as social media data, consumer data, lab data and patient generated health data. Patient generated data is actually really interesting for us in the consumer health space as this is collected directly from the patient in their home setting. So this data can be collected passively, for example, through wearables and sensors or actively through patient surveys. There are an increasing number of real world data sources becoming available. And when planning any real world study, it's also important to conduct an upfront feasibility to assess what data sources are available. And does the data source include the relevant data to answer your research question? One of the limitations here to be aware of 
is that real world use of non prescription medicines is largely uncaptured as it's not routinely collected. Um, for example, routinely collected data in EMR or claims databases does not include data on non prescription medicines. And this is just simply due to the fact that, that most non prescription medicines are not prescribed or reimbursed. So, consequently, this is not captured in these data sources. But on the other hand, EMR and claims data sources can be useful when planning your switch studies, when you need to assess the real world safety and effectiveness of the product as a prescription drug. This data could even be further enriched with, for example, patient generated health data, allowing you to develop a much more comprehensive uh, data set. Okay, and so then across the kind of product life cycle, how do you see RWE being used? Yeah, and looking at when we look at like one of the key benefits of, of, of RWE is that it enables us to better understand patient outcomes when drugs or devices are used outside of the context of a controlled setting. And it can also help to fill important evidentiary gaps when traditional RCTs are not feasible or appropriate. So when we look at how it's used across, if we say, the prescription product life cycle, it's used to demonstrate continued post-market safety and effectiveness. Um, it's been used to generate health economic data on usage and adherence of a product. And it's been used to understand patient unmet needs and make care pathways more patient-centric. And it can also be used to extend the value and usage of the product, like, for example, supporting label expansion in new populations or for new indications, or importantly here, it can be used to support Oryx to OTC switch. And Julie has already very nicely highlighted how we potentially leverage real world evidence um, across the switch life, life cycle. And much like prescription products, this can be used from early feasibility and planning right through to post switch evidence generation. So in summary, I really think we will continue to see real world evidence increasingly being used across the total product life cycle. Okay, then, and what are some of the dynamics then that could drive or facilitate the use of RWE for regulatory decision making? Yeah, I, I think probably to begin with, the original prescription drug that's planned to switch will increasingly already have an important source of, of real world evidence behind it. And this real world evidence may even have been used to support the Rx regulatory decision making. So it's setting already a good foundation for a switch. We also see that digital health technologies are driving access to patient-centric real world data sources, such as patient-generated health data. And regulators are increasingly interested in the area of patient science and collecting data directly from the patient. We also see innovative study designs using real world evidence that have been accepted for regulatory decision making. For example, in a randomized control trial, the comparator arm could potentially uh, be derived from real world data. There's also the use of mobile devices, decentralized clinical trials and remote monitoring. This will also facilitate pathways to collect relevant real world data in the home setting. That is also increasingly being accepted by regulators. And then finally, there, there's also increasing guidance on real world evidence best practices and standards being published by regulators that will support the industry in collecting high quality and fit for purpose uh, real world evidence. Okay, uh, and finally, before we go to video, are the regulators open to receiving RWE for decision making? Yeah. I think that, that's the question we're, we're, all, we're all asking, um, and this is something that we all need to collaborate on together to discuss. But under the right conditions, regulators are increasingly open to considering the use of real-world evidence to support regulatory decision-making. The data needs to be relevant, needs to be reliable, high quality, and it's fit for purpose to answer the research question. And an example just here from FDA CDRH, they say that in order to determine the suitability of real world data for regulatory decision making, FDA will assess the relevance and reliability of the source and its specific elements. And in the recent AESGP annual meeting, a representative from the European Commission discussed that we're moving into an era where we want to facilitate the use of real world data and real world evidence. And then went on to say that exclusivity will be given if the data can be shown to be as robust as that generated by clinical trials. 
So what I'd say is as you plan your switch studies, assess where you have evidence gaps and determine if these can potentially be filled by uh, with real world evidence. And then importantly, engage and engage early with the regulators to discuss the potential uh, to use real world evidence. That's great. Um, thanks, uh, Michelle. And uh, I think that was an important overview there from Volker, uh, Julie and Michelle. Uh, of what we mean when we talk about RWE and RWE and, and switch broadly. Um, and then more importantly, where it could play an actual role. And as Michelle mentioned there, it's still an area that regulators uh, trying to provide clarity on, you know, um, the industry wants that. And I'm delighted now to welcome Vidu. And uh, Vidu, I want to start from your personal perspective, really. Why is RWE worth it for the industry? You know, why put it in your switch word screams? And why is, what is industry tackling when they try to use these types of data? Um, yep, thank you. Um, I will try to attempt to answer the question. Uh, it's not as straightforward, I think, as, as you may think it is. Um, I'm just going to also caveat all of my responses with the fact that they are my responses, not those reflective of the Halion position. So um, I think real world evidence has tremendous potential for the purposes of enabling an RX to OTC switch program. Um, I think, unfortunately, though, where we are today is at least the drug division of FDA is still speculative about the value that this kind of evidence provides, particularly in a switch program. And I think that it's a real opportunity that we are able to use this evidence um, to further, I think, uh, characterize the safety of the product. Many of these prescription products have been on market for decades. And furthermore, many of them have already been non-prescription in countries outside the US. How can we harness that incredible data that exists to further substantiate a switch in the US and to demonstrate that the product can be taken safely? Because once you do take the product home, the experience of home use should be no different in the UK or any European country to the US. And I think that there's been um, a, a lack of attention given to that, to that idea of that, you know, that experience, that home use experience that an individual, a consumer, a patient may have uh, with a product once they take it home should really be very much representative of where, what you would see anywhere. Um, and I think that that's an important piece of how we can use then real world evidence and why it's relevant to the US um, Rx to OTC switch initiatives that are undertaken by sponsors. Um, I would and, also say, you know, oh, go ahead, sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> go ahead, that. continue, please. I was just gonna say, I, I think we have to relook at the threshold of evidence that we have been held to um, in terms of proving out an RX to OTC switch. Um, I think those, and I know from the poll, there's a variety of folks in the audience on where they are on their switch journey. Um, for me, I've been on this journey for almost 20 years, and I know many of my colleagues here um, are similar or even more than me. And I think that you know we're seeing a very different kind of environment in the U.S. that requires some kind of a reform. You know that the evidence needed to obtain approval for an RX to OTC switch needs to be relooked and needs to be reassessed uh, with a strong, strong industry input and strong scientific rationale. And I say that because Julie mentioned labeling studies, label comprehension, self-selection. Um, I think you know for those that may not may not know this kind of work as much this requires us to recruit people that don't even have the condition for which the drug is being treated for so you're asking people that have no real incentive to really answer your questions correctly because they don't they don't can't associate even with the condition you're recruiting people um, that that are just the general population um, i think that's that's problematic um, you know, how we are held to thresholds. Um, those should be very risk driven. Um, you know, what you have to achieve in a labeling study should be driven by the risk of the product. Uh, not that every endpoint needs to achieve a 90 or 100 percent threshold. So I think that there are elements of how we undertake a switch program 
that need to be relooked at, and then how we complement that data with real world evidence, I think is an important piece of, of how we now futuristically start to bring RX to OTC switches, you know, to a point where they can obtain approval. Um, so, so that was one thing. The other thing I wanted to just touch upon, which I think Volker did as well as Julie, is that when you look at RX to OTC switches outside the US, appreciating there is a third class of drug that we do not have here. Um, in spite of that, there is a lot more appetite um, from those governments to be approving those kinds of drugs. And so we talked about healthcare expenditure. We talked about the need for wider, broader accessibility in the US, a country where we're, we're a Western country, a very developed country, but we have many, many, many uh, US citizens and residents that don't have access to a physician. And there's a tremendous shortage to physicians in the US. So there should be more of a drive um, that comes from our government to want Rx to OTC switches. And I think that's a key difference between the US and ex-US markets, where Volker, Volker clearly said, you know, the MHRA is now saying, well, for countries that have switched products um, outside of the UK, they will further accelerate those switches in the UK because they will lean on the scientific rigor and review of the regulatory agency that originally performed it in the country of reference. So these are, I think, really important developments that we hope will impact the US and how the US thinks about essentially broadening access because we are all trying to do one thing, which is improve public health. And in order to improve public health, we all have to look at the benefits and risks of switches, not just the risks. And the discussion today um, and, and for the last many, many years uh, has been uh, outside of this conference around the risks and 100% on the risks and no really um, consideration for the benefits. So I think we need to bring back that part of the equation because it's a benefit risk consideration when you look at RX to OTC switches. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to harness all of the data on these incredible products that can help people and broaden access to them. So that's um, just a little bit of my thoughts on this um, and how then we could maybe look at real world evidence and apply it to our, our switches um, with the goal of bringing them to market. Okay, great. Thanks for doing. I know you'll be joining us for the for the Q and A in a couple of minutes' time, so uh, please ask any questions you want in the Q and A box there. And and Julie, I want to come to you before we uh, finish off and head into the Q and A today. There's a big call to action there, really, from video in terms of you know this is going to be a team game here going forward. Um, it's been a fascinating and energising session. So, how would you sum up what does the the future look like for Switch? Well, the potential benefits for an RX to OTC switch are huge. I think we've talked about that today uh, from increased sales and market expansion, but more impor importantly, to improve public health and relief for the healthcare systems as well. Um, with a supportive regulatory environment and advancing technology and the potential to tap into new indications in markets, uh, RX to OTC switch represents a significant opportunity for growth and impact uh, on the health of consumers everywhere. And I would just close by saying that, you know, we work in an amazing industry. Um, products that have switched over the counter status have changed our lives. We have accessible products to relieve symptoms for headache, fever, coughs and cold, heartburn and many others. What would we have done? What would the world have done during a global pandemic without these accessible OTC products for our families? We're now entering a new age, and it's an age where we can consider these safe and effective drugs that we have as Rx to move to OTC, where are drugs that have continuous use regimens and to help us manage chronic disease. There is a call to action here. To address today's health needs, we need to think about new products for SWITCH and innovative and accelerated ways to advance products to manage chronic healthcare needs, to improve health, and even to prevent disease in the future. 
To do this, we will need courage from innovation teams, collaboration from regulatory partners, and a heightened vision for truly improving public health. Okay, great. Thanks, Julia. Uh, I think with that, uh, kind of raising a very exciting ending there to, to the session for video and Julia, I think there's a real call to action here uh, for industry and also uh, the partners at the regulators as well. And we'll go into the Q&A now, we've had a lot of questions come in. And video, if I could bring you back first, really, the question come in uh, regarding the use of real world data. Uh, the question is, it seems obvious that regulators would object as the data are associated with patients that were evaluated, screened by a prescriber. How would a sponsor address this challenge? Well, I think that even as a prescription product, once the, the physician prescribes it, you the, the patient takes it home and they use it. There's really no intervention in the usage of the product. Um, I think if we believe that, that the, the the patient is talking to their doctor every day or has the doctor at their fingertips to, to counsel them, that that would be unrealistic expectation and thought, um, given that you can't even get an appointment with a doctor for months in the US. So I think that the, the use of a product at home, whether a prescription, OTC, whether in country A or B, would be no different um, and, and would be really based upon the initiative of the patient to comply with the labeling that they're given, whether it's an RX or an OTC. Okay, great, thanks for you. And uh, maybe Julie, uh, I could bring you in on this one. I think it's something you touched upon. But uh, why do you believe ex-US governments are actively encouraging switches, but the US FDA has not been proactive with, in with innovative switches? Yeah, good question. The you know there is a difference. Um, part of that, as we all know, is the difference just in the distribution uh, model. We don't have a third class of drugs. We don't have the quote behind the counter approach. Uh, we we are approaching some of that with the use of technology because it's a facilitated kind of approach. But we really just have two uh, classes of drugs. So that's that's one thing. I think the other thing is there's just a higher burden of proof in the U.S. The studies are larger, they're more complex, and the success thresholds are extremely high. Uh, when you consider 90% lower bound thresholds for a lot of our primary endpoints, and that's what, what they are, uh, then that's an observed rate of 95%. And that kind of perfection uh, is really tough. Uh, consumers are highly variable. And then the question really is, what's the risk? What's the true risk? Uh, and they're not all the same. Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. Um, uh, just a question on RWE here. I'm going to throw this out to, to all of you. Um, how do you think RWE can be as robust as RC, RCTs when R, RWE is looking at a retrospective use of a product? So anyone want to take that one? I, I, can, I can start um, with it. Um, so, you know, we're not looking for RWE to replace RCTs. We're looking to complement the RCT, looking at using these additional data sources to support uh, regulatory decision making where feasible. And when you look at, you have to look at the data and say, well, will it answer my research question? But one of the key things is you're, you're planning your studies, you still need to do feasibility. Now, would we say, would the data of a retrospective study be as robust as an RCT? Um, I don't think so, because the retrospective study is when you, when you have to assess the data, there might be uh, gaps in the data. Um, if you need to follow up on data on adverse events, you might be able to have access to the patient as well. So there's a, a right place for using retrospective data. Um, you have to assess your data source. It can be used to support regulatory decision making. We wouldn't compare it directly um, to an, an RCT study. Yeah, maybe, maybe now, I can add on that. Maybe I can add on that. So I think, of course, RCTs are considered as the gold standard, right? But we have also to consider that they are quite limited in terms of people using the products, right? Because there's a control about it that's already in the name of this kind of trials, while the usage in the real world setting is something completely different because people are using the products that have not been included maybe in those RCTs before. So we need to think a bit more forward 
in terms of how we create evidence. And it's not anymore the black and white system that we had in the past, where we have this randomized controlled trials and maybe an observational trial and so on. It's more that we put pieces of puzzles together and every piece of the puzzle is important to at the end have a full picture of evidence. And that's a bit of a, let's say, more future or currently already happening approach and, and different from what we had 10 years ago. So we need to consider that. I would okay, just great. add a Thanks. comment to, uh, sorry, uh, just a one comment I would add to that is that, you know, RWE can be prospective too. Uh, we've been talking about retrospective, but there's a lot of prospective work that could be done that is a variation on a theme from some of the studies that we've done to ask some of the core questions about current use. And I think that's really important because this is another way to gain important information about how the product's being used, uh, how it's used at home, as Vidu said now, what current practice patterns are, or even to answer, to, to merge that with uh, or balance that with some uh, retrospective data in terms of what is the incidence of some of the adverse events that we're so worried about, or what is the use or risk in some of these special populations? So I think the, the retrospective and the prospective, along with some of the traditional work that we've done, these things can work together in new ways. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, uh, one for you, Vidu, I just wanted to ask a kind of following up, really, on, on what you talked about during uh, your section here. We talked about working together, a kind of call to action, really, for kind of industry, etc. How do you see that working personally? You know, what, what what would be your kind of dream vision, if you would, for uh, Switch going forward? Uh, my dream vision would be that we would not have to do endless rounds of labeling studies that we would do very few actually optimize the label as we did when we first started uh, doing Rx to OTC switches many years ago. We would use reasonable thinking to make changes to labels and we would be permitted to go into an actual use trial to show what consumer home use looks like when a consumer has access to the product and then be permitted to go into if it's if it's applicable, an advisory committee in order for a, a group of experts to make a call. Uh, so it would it would be a much more accelerated path than we have today. And the reason for that is these are safe and effective products. They've been established. They've been on market for decades and we are looking to further expand their usage. So in order to do that, we should be permitted to take a reasonable approach and, and, and move at pace. Um, so that would be my dream if we could do that. And, um, and how we do that, I think will require we in industry to, to work and pull set a number of different levers, but come together as one to, to push for a reform in this space. Okay, great, thanks, Susie. And I think we're just coming up to the hour now, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. Uh, I just want to thank very, uh, thank everyone for their time, their contributions and hard work to this webinar today. It's been a, a fantastic journey getting here, working with uh, Julie, with Volker, Michelle and Vidu as well. I want to thank you, our audience, for, for joining us. If you have any more questions or you want to get in contact, feel free. Uh, Julie, Volker and Michelle are all available here for you to talk to. Um, and with that, I just say if you want any more information on the capabilities and services that IQVIA Consumer Health can offer, please visit IQVIAConsumerHealth.com. And with that, I'll say thank you very much to our speakers, Julie, Volker, Michelle and Vidu. Thank you again to our audience and hope to see you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.